Hi, I'm Alan Bresnik, Cable Video Practice Leader of Light Reading. I'm here in Denver at SCTE's Cable Tech Expo show. We're we'll talking about distributed access architecture. I'll be talking to Dean Stoneback, who is Senior Director of Engineering at SCTE. Okay, let's start with the basics. What is distributed access architecture and what are the basic different types of DAA? Distributed access architecture is an architecture being talked about a lot in the industry because it's a way to perhaps save uh, some money by taking the, uh, some of the processing deeper into the network. So today's uh, architectures, the HFC networks, have all of the processing in the, in the head end, in a central head end, so it's called a centralized architecture. And then you go out through uh, fiber optic cables into the node in the plant and then out to the homes. In a distributed architecture, you would take some of that processing and put it out into the plant. And the reason to do that, as I said earlier, would be to hopefully save some money because this digital transport would use Ethernet optics. So it looks attractive to use Ethernet optics to get the signals from the head end out into the plant instead of using analog optics like we do today. So given that the desire is to take the digital transport out into the network, out to the node, then there are several ways you could do that. Um, and there's, there's multiple amounts of processing power that you would put out into the node. So the lowest level, sometimes called remote phi, would be to simply put the, the RF creation piece out into the network. So if you're doing that with a, uh, with a analog, or I'm sorry, with a digital video signal, then it's fairly obvious that you just send a transport stream out and you would create the RF out here. If you do it with DOCSIS, you also have to receive the upcoming signals from DOCSIS and send them back out up to the head end. Uh, then there is added orders of complexity that you might put out here in the node. You can move up the stack and you might put the entire phi of the DOCSIS out there. You might put part of the MAC out there. You might put essentially the entire CMTS out there, all of the processing of the CMTS. Um, so today we have a, a CMTS architecture called an, an MCMTS where you've separated the CMTS into pro packet processing and um, the RF part of it. And so you might use that split and put some of the network out there. Or perhaps you might put pretty much the entire CMTS functionality out here, which is sometimes called remote CCAP. So there are all kinds of layers of how much equipment you might put out here in the node. Uh, but they're all parts of a distributed access architecture where you're distributing some of the processing between the head end and some of it out in the node. Dean, cable operators have barely started deploying CCAP chassis in their head ends. So why are they already looking to deploy some of that equipment and some of that CCAP functions in the network? The reason to put some of the functions out into the network is usually coupled with the desire to pull the functions that you don't put out into the network to pull them deeper into the core of the network. So the idea is that the hubs have very limited space and the hubs continue to grow and more and more equipment goes into these hubs. So if you could split the functionality in half and put some of the functionality out into the plant, you could then pull some of it back into your core network, into your big data centers. Um, so that allows you then to free up room in your hubs. So the, the real main, the main driver to split it in half would be to do that, which to save room in the hubs. And then, as I said a moment ago, it also has the added advantage that these two pieces can be connected with digital fiber optics, which is a commodity um, and is less expensive than the um, AM optics that the cable operators use today. Okay, Dean, what are the pros and cons of distributed access architecture? And what are the pros and cons of the different types of DAA? So there's, uh, there's pros and cons between the various types of distributed access architectures as well as pros and cons over whether you would do a distributed access architecture in the first place or not. Um, so let me start with the bigger one. Why would you do a distributed access architecture? Uh, today's networks are hybrid fiber coax networks. And think about it as whether a network is active or passive and whether it's smart or dumb. So today's networks are actually active and dumb. Our RF networks today, no insult intended on the network, but there's no intelligent processing going on out in the network. And that has served us very well because these networks have expanded from 330 megahertz on up to one gigahertz. They were never designed to carry data in the first place, but DOCSIS came along and they can do data. Then DOCSIS 2.0 came along and added more features in the upstream and they can do it. DOCSIS 3 came along and added bonding and the same networks can do it. DOCSIS 3.1's coming along and the same networks can keep on doing it because the network is dumb. Nothing has to get changed in the network. 
Uh, PONS, which are not part of what we're discussing today, is a passive network. So it's a dumb passive network. What we're talking about here is the possibility of making it a smart network. So then it would be an active smart network. And that allows some of the processing power to go out into the network, get them out of the hubs where there's no space. Uh, if they can fit into, into the nodes in the network, then you've enabled this processing power to move from, from hubs out into the network. The perhaps disadvantage of that would be that the dumb network has served us very well because you didn't need to do any upgrades out in the network to make changes. So what the MSOs have to consider is, is this maybe the, the one do-it-all final time for the HFC network? Perhaps this is the time to put that intelligence out in the network to optimize the network for the next 10 or 15 years with a plan that by that time then we'd probably be headed towards ponds. So this might be the time it makes sense to put intelligence out in the network. To date, the intelligence has not been out in the network. So then, like that, you have multiple distributed access architectures. How much intelligence do you really want to put out there? And there's pros and cons to the various ways. Some saying, let's put as little out there as possible, the remote phi. Others saying, let's not mess with how DOCSIS works and how we split the CMTS in half, and let's put the entire CMTS functionality out there, sometimes called remote CCAP. Dean, what's needed for cable operators to make distributed access architecture a reality? To make the distributed access architecture a reality, I mean, obviously we need equipment. So to make equipment, first of all, it has to be defined. So there's many talks within the industry over what this looks like. That's part of the reason we're having this interview, is what, what types of remote access architectures are being considered. Um, to make it a reality, then there has to be some synergy over how much of that functionality, of that type, because we can't have everybody working on everything. So we, I believe we need some industry consensus on what the architecture really looks like, some specifications to drive what goes out there. Uh, another concern for operators is that the makers of the CMTS equipment are sometimes the same, but not always the same as the makers of the node equipment. Um, so most of the major CMTS manufacturers also make nodes. Most of the nodes manufacturers make CMTSs, but there are some that don't do either. And major operators don't always have the same vendor in the same plant at the same time. So this gets a little difficult in to say, who's responsible when you put vendor A's CMTS in vendor B's node, given that vendor B might make their own CMTS and doesn't really want vendor A's to work in the node. So there's a, a, a need for standards for that interoperability also out in the node if this is to become a reality. All right, given that, Dean, how will cable operators make the transition to distributed access architecture? To make the transition, first of all, when there's equipment, when there's standards, then the, the operators have to first get that first plant online. So to do that, we need a different head-end piece of equipment. Uh, so it's not the CMTS of today, it's a CMTS, it's, it's the router above the CMTS that does the subscriber management. So however that standard's drawn out, that processing piece has to be in place, whether it's in the hub or the data center. And then, once that processing piece is ready to go, then the rest of the migration is fairly simple. It's just like a node split, where you just go out into the node and put the new equipment out in the node. So you just turn off the HFC and turn on the distributed architecture. But step one would be to have all the processing ready to go in the head end. So I believe it's a relatively simple migration once the standards exist, once the equipment exists. Uh, as I said, but the first step is to get the head end ready to go, and then you just migrate the plant. Okay, thanks a lot, Dean. That was extremely thorough.